Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. Available on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and your favorite hangouts for podcasting. And always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, where we're supporting the new Pure and Bi- Biodynamic Wine Club, where you get delivered to your door organic and biodynamic wines each and every month. And we have a we have a late entry today. We're actually very excited to have uh, Stetson Robbins in, and uh, we were just laughing because of some previous history that I totally had blanked on, and so I'm glad to, to reconnect on this, and we're going to have some fun. So welcome, Stetson. I appreciate coming in and having some time with us. Good to see you again. This is... Uh, this is a no holds barred uh, podcast. We're not gonna. Pe- we're peeling it all back, man. We're not gonna mess around. Like <laughs> so, an orange. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like an orange wine, maybe. Right. <laughs> no, we're gonna talk about biodynamic wines, orange wines. We're gonna talk about his career uh, and his new project, which is focused on orange wines. And everybody asks me, "What's an orange wine?" In fact, I asked my daughter. This, and I'm glad you brought up your Brooklyn thing. She brought me my first orange wine from Brooklyn, so we'll talk about that. But tell me a little bit about what you're doing right now with uh, with the Black Lamb Project, and we'll go back in your history. Uh, so my wife and I started Black Lamb uh, a little over a year ago. Um, we're a California-based wine importer that's focused on uh, two regions, uh, the Slovenian Italian largely, and a little bit of surrounding. Uh, the Slovenian Italian border uh, and uh, the Republic of Georgia um, are th- the focus of our selection is um, very much uh, uh, focused on uh, what we could call you mentioned ancient wine like yes. Ambeth it's like yeah. you're going back in time going back in time <clears throat> I think that this is th- this is something that we hope to you know push even further and encourage you know we went to uh, I went to New York for a misnomered wine tasting called the best wines of the world or the late best wines of the world and there were it, oddly it, interestingly enough it was four vendors or suppliers that have not come to America before and I spent a lot of time at a Georgian table I spent a lot of time at a Macedonian table and a Moldavian table and a Slovenian table and fascinating parts of the world for wine but tell me how you got into this part of the business so we go back you had brought a gentleman to taste wines we'll talk about that in a second but prior to that you were what were you doing that got this bug which we all have in in wine so in college i uh majored in theater and a large oh so it's a whole act this whole thing's an act okay totally (laughs) i mean it's sales Um, that's right uh the uh uh I folk uh, like a. Uh, I studied the uh, uh, Greek deity Dionysus. I had a teacher that taught a pagan culture class that was very focused on this specific Greek deity, and uh, it, at the time it struck me because I couldn't imagine what a culture was like that was so focused that where wine is something of such significant of such significance. Oh, it it represented almost. <clears throat> like half of their civilization you had the two primary deities apollo and dionysus and they they were the duality that 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 ruled uh the the uh, greek gods and so in studying uh greek theater becoming interested in wine uh just philosophically uh i found myself waiting tables in a restaurant that had a uh uh, unusually developed wine program because the restaurant also owned a winery uh babcock uh is the my good friend brian babcock but wait so you're uh greek studies acting struggling actor working at a restaurant now that's a prophetic thing right but you added this wine component this greek deity thing yeah because it was that was that was part of what um when i started working at waltz and uh if i wanted to wait tables i had to learn something about wine uh the i was already kind of primed because you know i was curious to learn a little bit about wine but also you know found it um it wasn't something that i had a lot of you know understanding or experience of and it was quite complicated there were all these different varieties all these different regions yeah, you different glasses and and so this i was waltz wharf this is in seal beach <coughs> seal beach still yeah. there still there still yeah. there yeah still a babcock product yeah you well, can go okay. drink you know, Babcock Probably Chardonnay and water. drink <laughs> and all and the other things he makes. <laughs> uh, so you, so you, uh, you know, it's interesting you said that because you know we eat out quite a bit now. Our kids aren't home, and it's a, it amazes me what waiters and waitresses don't know about wines and what they don't understand what they're per, per, 
per viewing, as well as the fact that when you have a really big list, it's even harder to understand. Yeah. So we went to New York, and I, just, I forgot the name of the restaurant. You would know it. Fancy place. And I ordered a 86 Bordeaux because I had featured it in the club. I wanted to see how it was doing. And the psalm that had never tasted it. So I invited her to sit with us and have a glass because she needed to taste it, right, to understand it. Mm-hmm. So you just took it on your own to decide you should learn about this stuff. Uh, well, the, they sort, the restaurant was really, uh, they were really focused on the wine program and the staff being well-educated early on. And so that they were, they, they, and I think they actually like, they paid for my first level oh, of, wow, okay, for yeah. quartermaster sommelier. Sure. So they wow. were, they were really supportive of, That's great. like they wanted people on the floor that knew the wines and, and, and I was, you know, eager to learn. Um, and it eventually turned into, uh, uh, after after waltz, I wanted to continue with the quartermaster sommelier training. I worked at a restaurant in Disneyland called Napa Rose, which was uh, one of the area, one of the uh, the quartermaster sommeliers were doing their testing at Disneyland. And so, if you were part of the Napa Rose, you would just get to do the quartermaster sommelier. St- you got kind of like wrapped yeah, up right. into it. So I just had uh, just uh, not to interrupt you, but I just had Matt Ellingson, who's the who runs uh, Royal Twenty One or Twenty One Royal, which is the level above Club 33, mm-hmm. right? So there's this floor now where they have these $15,000 a seating dinners oh. at Disneyland. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah. It's considered the most expensive restaurant in, in, in the country. I didn't realize that. I, we've been to three-star Michelin restaurants in Monaco that didn't cost nearly as that much, right? So he was telling me about the Napa Rose program, how important it is to most of cuisine in this Orange County. It's just a very famous place in regards to training, uh, list oh, yeah, quality, yeah. food quality. I mean, I, I think I I think they're still doing the core. I haven't been. It was This was 2000. Uh, when was I there? Like 2005. Oh, I see. Okay. I I don't know if they're still doing as much of the training stuff there, but um, but no, it was it for What's me it? it was a really big opportunity because I wanted to pursue becoming a master of wine. Yes. And or a uh, uh, master psalm. Master psalm. Uh, in doing it, I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. I I uh, uh, I wasn't interested in table service so much as really getting as deep into wine as possible. After that, I ran a little shop. After Napa Rose, uh, I traveled in France a little bit with a, a friend that I had developed who was an importer working for a wine warehouse, Peter Mann. Yeah, our old friend, man. Uh, I, Heritage of France. Heritage of France, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he, he was really, he was one of the first people that really. Um, uh, he took me to Bordeaux and Burgundy in 2006. So yeah. I was getting to barrel taste the 2005 vintage, which wow. was quite special in sure. both of those places. And we got to, I wouldn't have had been able to have this experience without him. Well, how did you hook up with Peter Mann? I mean, he was the import specialist at the wine warehouse, you know, and yeah, John I was, Schliff, his boss. So I was that. running, I was running a little wine, or I was working, first I worked at a wine shop. Uh, that was pretty focused on inexpensive French wines. Uh, uh, it's called Vindupe Wines, and uh, it's no longer there. But all of the wines were fifteen dollars or under, and almost everything that we, anything that Peter was bringing in that could work price wise, well, he we had were, value-oriented wines generally. Yeah, right? yeah, so. yeah. But also some really nice, you know, yeah, some things that were <laughs> so that funny. were not so value-oriented. Yeah. Um, but a lovely guy, and I learned a lot from him. And uh, after retail, uh, I, I, I didn't plan to try each area of the wine business. But after restaurants and retail, I ended up curious to see what the wholesale side of things was. Um, and so, a uh, two. And many would say, what are you, crazy? <laughs> yeah, the dark side. <laughs> yeah. That's the dark side. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but the the. The experience in France, I, 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 what I figured out is that what I wanted to work, who, the the people that I wanted to work most closely with were the winemakers, and the people who got to work most closely with the winemakers are the importers. And so, uh, Peter, you know, I was I, 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 I hadn't really thought about it until now, but I think I kind of, I kind of wanted to be able to do what Peter was yeah, doing, which would be a great job. Right? Yeah, and uh, and I and at one point I was actually considering to work at Wine Warehouse, um, 
Instead, uh, a buddy of mine, Kevin Stewart, convinced me uh, to to help him sell some Australian wines that he was working with, uh, and uh, and then I picked up this book of strange Eastern European wines that was uh, a company called Blue Danube Wine, and so I had really good New World wines from Australia, and then I had really exotic European wines, and I felt like that would be a good combination wow. yeah. to you know. So that's an interesting uh, concept there because I went through the same kind of decision once where I decided to get out of corporate America and go do something on my own. So, But here you are thinking of maybe Wine Warehouse, which would be corporate America in the world of wine. It's very structured, uh, you know, family-owned, but very structured. And Wine Warehouse, just for the listeners, is a, one of the great uh, wholesale houses in, in Southern California specializing in wine particularly, obviously, in and didn't, didn't the Meyerson brothers own the Sunkiss jelly candy too, or uh-huh. something like that, right? So yeah, that was I think the start. I think the, the candy more came money first. doing that, right? <laughs> so, but you decided to go on your own, basically. Go, I mean, selling for Kevin. Who would want? I don't know who would want to do that? But um, sorry, Kevin. Uh, then, <laughs> and then picking up your own book, which which were these Eastern Eastern European wines. Yeah, I mean, when I went into the wholesale side of things, um, uh, it, I don't think I had necessarily the ambition to have my own import company at that time. I was just trying to explore another area of the industry. And um, it was fun to drag a bag of wine around. And, you know, this was... Uh, so with the this the Eastern European wines, um, uh, some of the best restaurants and in, in shops in Los Angeles were interested in these things because mm-hmm. they were so... Uh, uh, you know, the the basically when... Uh, Yugoslavian communism ended and you know when the socialist systems of Hungary and in Yugoslavia broke apart in the late 80s early 90s you know fast forward 20 years later they've reprivatized the wine industry and you start to see some real like uh, you start to see indications of the potential Mm -hmm. and they were positive Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the producers were smart uh, not to rip out their vineyards and plant international varieties but instead to make their focus their local indigenous mm-hmm. grapes mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so sort of is 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 the over the last 10 years I think what we've seen is a, a sort of a diversification of the of the um, of what we see on the shelves and on wine lists both in terms of regions styles grape varieties and uh, that's just such I can't, I can't think of so a more exciting it's part. an interesting thing because I'm Armenian and we've <clears throat> I've been to Armenia in 2006 tasted their wines they're horrible but I think the Soviet in the Soviet bloc you know the Georgians were the wine manufacturing group and the Armenians were the brandy group and that's basically the way it was set up you, this is what you're going to do this is what you're going to do and then when, the, when it broke down Armenia now has technologies in making wines but you brought um the slow, I mean, it's so funny. I mean, you cracked me up when you, when you reminded me that you brought the, 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 the very first podcast, my podcast, the first video I ever did. And I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I still don't really. I've got a camera. I've got this cheap bar, and I decided to do this thing. And you brought in Miha, and Ivan, what was this? Ivan and Miha Batic. Ivan Batic, yeah. and yeah. we and and I remember the wines because they're Bordeaux based. I thought that was fascinating, uh-huh. you know, Bordeaux varietals, and they were very good. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And we did this segment, and that lighting was bad, and who knows what the sound was like. But then I got an email from from Miha, the young man who was probably what in his twenties then, probably something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. He's, he emailed me. He says, "Please mm. take down the video because I don't I like my English." And I'm like, <laughs> "You're kidding." <laughs> I'm like. I'm like, no, I'm not taking it down because this is the first thing I've ever done on a media thing. I'm keeping it up he there. He emailed you, know? you? Yeah, he emailed me. Isn't that funny, though? Who knows? Was it, when do you think that was? I mean, I think it would have had to have been... Like 10 years ago? 15 yeah. years ago? More, maybe even more. Well, 10, a little over 10 years yeah. ago. So yeah. was that with Blue Danube at the I time? I was with Blue Danube at the I time, see, okay. yeah. So Blue Danube was bringing in these Eastern Bloc wines. Yeah, they, they Blue Danube was uh, founded by a husband and wife he uh, is German 
she Hungarian. Uh, they came from the tech industry, and uh, uh, they lived in Vienna and Budapest. Mm doing like selling computer systems and uh eventually they came back to the united states they were both like expatriates originally and when they came back to the united states the austrian and hungarian wines that they were uh that they fell in love with while they were out there were not available in the united states so um they without having any customers they organized a container full of wine Ooh. Uh, <laughs> they bought most i think it was all austrian wine and that would be death to most to most companies right? that would be as as yeah you start absolutely um not only did they 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 bought a container full of austrian wine they bought one pallet of ice wine which took 10 a years to, a pallet of ice wine took 10 years to sell that uh no gruner Veltliner, uh, a lot of chardonnay not, you know, the, well <laughs> So it was. It's container. If anybody knows, is uh, what twelve hundred to fifteen hundred cases, depending yeah. on how you stack them. Yeah. And uh, you know, in the world of wine, that's a monumentous task. And I think we've had a podcast, a podcast with Alex Garacci from from Chile, who did the same thing. He didn't know anything. He, was, he came here to play soccer, and he brings in a container of Chilean wines into San Francisco, no less, like the worst market <laughs> to try and sell it. And he goes, "Oh no, <laughs> what yeah. did I do?" So what happened to this container? Well, so they. Uh, uh, they actually they, they did bring in some they brought in some wines that started getting attention with some of the like uh, uh, better uh, pro like wine programs they're in San Francisco as yeah. well and so um, uh, I was running a small shop uh, and looking for you know wines to to diversify the weekly tastings that we were organizing and I became interested in Eastern Europe um, by virtue of latitude if you look at the 45th parallel and you follow it uh, east through Europe there's a lot of territory that we don't talk about and this is understood as kind of that ideal position for grape cultivation and uh, and lo and behold all of these places have really long histories and yeah, their own sure. grapes and their own cultures of productions their own uh, methods of like styles of production um, and so Frank was coming down to LA to sell wine, um, and he was doing this. You know, it, it, that's no what you can't sell wine in LA driving from San Francisco. No, it's hard to do. Yeah, though it was done for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and, and technically that's what I'm doing here right now. <laughs> but uh, uh, when he came down, I was so taken with the wines and how different they were that I asked him if I could like, can I be the guy who sells these down here? Yeah, oh, and so. Great. That was um, that's how it started. Uh, but you're still at retail then. I was at retail, yeah. getting ready to jump to did, wholesale. Did you bring those wines into the retail shop? Or are you yeah. had already done that? Yeah. And so, yeah. how was the reception in California? Uh, you know, anything in California that's imported is a little more difficult because we have our own trade. But now you're looking at Eastern Bloc wines, places that people probably didn't realize even grew grapes for mm -hmm. wine. Was it was it well received? Before the Silver Lakes of the world, yeah, we had well, Silver Lake was one of the first supporters. Yeah, yeah, that's they were one of the first ones that were buying. Um, they, uh, our customers, we we had it was like a pretty community oriented shop. So a lot of the people, um, w we would see them on a weekly basis, and so they they were coming, and it didn't really matter what we. You know, they were open to learning. They were there to be exposed to, you know, these you know different wines. Yeah. And so um, always eager to, you know, they were always like open. What sold, you know, what, what would sell well? You know, what did people actually like? You know, then that becomes, you know, which, are, which of the wines from those areas then became things that people would buy is, you know, is sort of another question. That's a whole different question. Yeah. So I just bought some wine from a defunct club. Uh -huh. uh, and I haven't tasted too much Slovak Slovenian or Slovakian wine uh -huh. lately. I don't seem as much, but uh, it was. <laughs> I got access to these great quantities of great wines. They've done a very good job. It was Slovenian. I can't remember the brand now, but um, they had sourced some very nice wines, and they had prepared the whole club, brought in the wines, they had pallets of it. They had done the newsletters. They researched it, and they had curated nice wines. And then the the celebrity chef who this was patterned for was Todd English, the guy with um, 
olives in those restaurants and then he got busted by the me too movement and so the club never started and they, oh were, looking, <laughs> they were looking for a place to move oh, this stuff really quickly perfect and that was the first time that i tasted wine from that area again uh-huh. until we went to croatia two years ago uh-huh. a year and a half ago and i was fascinated by the region and the variety of grapes didn't recognize any of them of course and in fact most of the restaurants and you can probably bear this out that we ate that were croatian restaurants did not have french or american wines on them is that normal like, yeah, uh, yeah. You mean in Croatia? And yeah. Slo- yeah. I mean, when you're when you're in those areas, you're uh, anything that you see that would be French or American would probably be pretty, you know, uninspired. Right. And something industrial and, and something for the tourists that don't that know don't. Yeah. Right. That, but the the one of the big successes was um, Plavac Mali, and this is the red grape mm-hmm. of Croatia, mm-hmm. and it's the uh, it's uh, the genetic offspring of Zinfandel. And so right, that's right. Yes. That was one of the. That's one of the stories. That's you know the, there was uh, when uh, uh, what's her name, Carol Meredith, when the when like the grape genetics when they were f- just figuring out how like to um, uh, like uh, what is it like write the genome or yeah right or, yeah, sure, yeah sure. W- w- when they just figured yeah. out how to do the genetic you know to test grape varieties genetically. Uh, they were looking for something to pursue and Mike Gergic was convinced that California Zinfandel was a Croatian variety. Really? And that's, I know Mike was Croatian, but I didn't know that was his. Yeah. That's, and so he, 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 he convinced them, you know, he convinced Davis basically that this would be a good, you know, way for them to, you know, utilize these new, uh, 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 this new ability to test grape varieties yeah. genetically to really understand what is it, where did it come from, and um, he was wrong that uh, Zinfandel was not identical. It wasn't um, identical to Plavac Mali from Croatia, which is what he had, uh, which is what he had uh, 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 kind of guessed. Uh, but he was not. He, they they found the identical uh, genetic match. Uh, growing wild on the on the side of a vineyard, and Plavac Mali, which is you know prolific across Dalmatia, uh, southern Croatia, uh, is the offspring. It's like a you know, wow. few hundred That's year old offspring That's of Zinfandel. Yeah. So, Blue Danny was bringing in these things. You were wrapping them, mm-hmm. and then he went to New York. <clears throat> well, so my when I started with Blue Danny, I had no experience in wholesale. I'd never, I had, n- I'd never worked for an importer, um, but, but Blue Danube was also, you know, this was a second career for the owners, and uh, um, they didn't have a lot of, ex- none of us had a lot of experience, and so uh, we learned together. My role in the company grew. Uh, I was responsible for uh, doing all sorts of label projects. Miha came to my wife and my wedding. You know, really? so, yeah. So we became, you know, this. That's great. <laughs> this was over ten years. I, I was so I was selling in Los Angeles for five years, and over that time, I became, you know. I was responsible for, I don't know what percentage of the portfolio, but it would have been more than half of it. That's and amazing. so um, a lot of the, uh, uh, we, so I was in Los Angeles. People started, you know, we were, we were selling some wine. It was working. We were bringing in more wine. The company was growing. Some more salespeople were kind of like, oh, like, what is this Blue Danube kind of taking interest? And we, we, we kind of start to grow. And then we start feeling confident. So we're like, oh, let's go sell wine in New York. That'll mm-hmm. be easy. <laughs> yeah, no problem, right? <laughs> so we, there was, we hired a woman out there who did a really good job, um, or as good of a job as she could have, considering you know what resources she had and um, uh, uh, that she wasn't supported. She was like a one-man band. In in New York City, uh, and uh, the, the, excuse me, for the deliveries were coming to L.A. or in the East Coast and being driven here. The, your, the, your, the wines you were selling here, they're coming to L.A. port, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, Oakland and Oakland and Long Beach. Okay, so she yeah. now she's in New York and she's got access to, I guess, a few cases. But you you ask the right question because yeah, we we were feeding New York with small cases just right. to kind of yeah. start, which is know, expensive, which is expensive. Yeah. But there were customers that were interested in the wines and they were you know committed to taking them, and so it was you know justified and. Uh, uh, you know, this idea of growing into something national was, you know, pretty exciting for, you know, 
for us, even sure. though we were completely naive. Right. And uh, so you, but you asked the right question. Uh, when we shipped the full container, when we finally decided to ship a container to New York, uh, the person, the woman that was selling the wines, decided that she wanted to raise. And it was like no problem, <laughs> just sell more wine. Yeah, because we got was coming in, <laughs> and and it and it and she wasn't you know it wasn't she wasn't able to make. Uh, she ended up it ended up not working out, but we had a container of wine in New York. Oh no! So my wife and I so, reduced what we own to a pallet, <laughs> to a single pallet. <laughs> That's not easy. It wasn't. Yeah. U- UPSed it to Brooklyn. And in three weeks, moved from New York to Brooklyn. Wow, to, what a to, wonderful woman. To take, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what. Yeah, where, I wouldn't have been what big I got trouble. her I moved into. two blocks and I got in trouble. <laughs> no, she was she was she actually joined the company at that time when I we see. moved to handle the admin side of it. Yeah. That was what allowed us to make this move. Um, and uh, I thought that people were going to be really excited to buy wines from me when I moved to uh, Brooklyn. Um, they had seen everything. <laughs> yeah, because it's the East Coast. It's, I mean, yeah. they, have, they have way more than we do. Yeah, they were jaded. Yeah. And so what was supposed to be a six-month project turned into a 18-month project turned into five years. <laughs> Oops. And, uh, <laughs> and we didn't want to stay there permanently. My wife got pregnant. We have family in Northern California where we wanted to ultimately settle down. And so we moved back to California and um, and continued to work on, we were trying to build distribution for Blue Danube nationally, but the owners were getting to a point where they were trying to slow down. I was trying to speed up. And so um, we ended up separating mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, a couple of the producers that I had brought to the portfolio, um, they didn't want to continue working with Blue Danube if I was going to leave, and so uh, they basically said, "Why don't you know? Why don't you sell our wines by yourself?" And it—that's uh, a great story. It gave me an opening, and yeah. now we're on—we're organizing container five and six. Hey, oh, so it's, that's great! This yeah. is, congratulations. So this is what a year, two years now. Uh, about a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. five, six containers. That's pretty quick. Yeah. Particularly yeah. in this marketplace, where I suppose, though, I mean, we've we're we're, we're, we're working on packing our fifth and sixth. Yeah. Okay. So I get we're it. so we've but we've sold about yeah. four containers. No, I get it. But yeah, this is a uh, this is a tough business right now. I mean, there's a ton of different wines. I think you're doing the right thing because. Uh, if you want to jump in the fray with you know one euro per liter wines that are coming from Europe, you know you're going to lose this game because yep. I can't. I mean, I I can't play in it. Yeah. Uh, the the logistical side of the business, which is the, the consumer side, that you get you. No one would say, hey, the, well, the wholesale side is great too because we know how hard it is. Mm-hmm. But the consumer side right now is extraordinarily congested mm-hmm. and it's full of crap. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just basically one euro per liter junk they're bringing in. Mm-hmm. But the trek is to New Jersey, up the coast to New York, gets bottled, sent out to wherever, going to all these different competitors of mine. But you have a very unique niche. And I think that the public is looking for something experiential about experimenting with wines, trying new things, and it's the marketplace that's going to prevail in the sense of if you're going to make money on the wholesale side, if your company wants to be successful, mm-hmm. it has to be on that side. Mm-hmm. It has to be on the side where the consumer is learning something. Mm-hmm. You know, And maybe a, a tougher hand sell because they're from the Soviet bloc or from the... Mm-hmm. Middle Unfamiliar. East. It's, it's right. Yeah, it does... The wines that we're working with... So with Black Lamb... Uh, the company that my wife and I have founded, um, we it gives us the opportunity to kind of go. Uh, so I worked with Blue Danube. I covered a lot of geography. You know, if it, it, a much larger geography than if you combined France, Italy, and Spain in terms of just you know square miles. <laughs> That's a lot. And uh, and no, I mean Eastern. You're talking about Europe, sourcing in Eastern Europe. Yeah, That's like I mean, if, you, if yes. you look at if you look at like from Croatia to Georgia yeah. to uh, Slovakia, this is a huge part. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a huge. lot of land. Um, it's a, it's the, it's like I mean, Georgia wouldn't be considered Europe proper, but Central w- w- Americans think of when they think of Europe, what they're really thinking about is Western Europe. Yes, that's correct. And and Central Europe is huge, and uh, 
I, you know, I was largely ignorant to it, in t- both both uh, geographically, culturally, uh, in terms of cuisine. Uh, I was just, you know, completely. Uh, my introduction to these cultures was through the wine. You know, I got hooked to the wines because the flavors yes. are so unique and different. And if you have these, you know, notions of uh, if terroir is something that you're interested in, um, this is something that you can, you know, it's quite uh, the the, the the, the notions of terroir are quite unique and different from what you're uh, accustomed to from France and Italy. Yeah, so that way, let's pause on that for a second. That, that, is, that is what it's about, right? We, we want to have our customers experience the terroir of something, and that's, it's, the grape varietal is obviously very important, but uh, and I make this comment a lot, and you're going to explain this with, with your wines, but what other product can you pick up make in a European country or wherever and bring it across the world, across the 48th parallel, all the way around the other side of the world and plop it on the table and say, this is what we represent. And so when it comes, the movement towards terroir, maybe it's, it's not new, but I think to the consumer it's relatively new. Mm-hmm. To the enophile, no big deal. We all get it. We This is what we study. But to the regular consumer who's trying to break out of these one year a liter wines, this is what we try to sell them the idea of the terroir so tell me about the terroir of these countries are they vastly different and is it compared to like a burgundy where it's like across the street you know the, the terroir is different mm-hmm. or more like a bordeaux where it's a little more gradual or a napa well so the big uh <clears throat> the big element for me that we leave out of when we talk about terroir is culture and I think that the perspective on taste that the that the people who are making the wine has uh, what they you know what they eat mm-hmm. uh, uh, what they like mm-hmm. uh, that coupled with the resources that they have access to uh, is you know that is also part of terroir sure it is yeah that's a and, great thought and and I think also the market is part of terroir <clears throat> if you don't have a if you don't have a table to compare things on you don't know that they're different right if you don't take the products out of their native environment and put them in a non-native environment where they can be compared with you know other examples then you don't know that you don't know what the di- you can't quantify you can't these quanti- differences you're right that's a really good point so the the name black lamb is it comes from a book called black lamb and gray falcon which is uh, it was written between the first and second world war uh, it's uh, the full title is a journey through former Yugoslavia, <clears throat> and it's this uh, big travelogue that deals largely with the interpretation of culture. Uh, it was written by a British woman who was trying to interpret uh, the Slavic cultures of Yugoslavia in this very critical period in uh, uh, you know human history. And <clears throat> if you boil down the book to its like its one of its core tenets, it would be that. Uh, what we see in another culture says more about us than it does about the other culture. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And so For sure. the the uh, that's real very interesting. Working with these producers is uh, uh, I had an experience in Slovenia where a winemaker was asking me to. Uh, he's like, "How should we make it? How should we change the wine? You know, what what do you want?" And I'm like, "No, no, no! Don't you make what you make and and all." And I'll buy it if I like it. <laughs> I, like I, I had. I don't this, want you to change. What I don't. You're yeah, doing. I didn't. I felt. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to. Ch- I don't want to influence. I, you know, I, I had yeah. this idea that sure. like I'm in a vacuum and I'm an anthropologist and I'm trying to find this, you know, this authentic thing and I might risk damaging it because now he's asking. He's telling you what the, yeah. He's asking me what should I do. I'm like, put coconut in it. Let's put, let's put some. Well, coconuts but wait a minute. You're right it. though, because that just goes to your point about the terroir should include the. the the palates and the community and where it's grown besides just the soil because that influences what things taste like as well as the food right um, and it's funny it's an interesting point you brought up we went to an Italian restaurant the night and I wanted to and I had friends that just got back from Chianti and they're they're complete Napa cab fanatics so that's what they have in their cellar and I said okay she wants to go to an Italian dinner for their anniversary I'm gonna I'm gonna start from the north and bring some Piemonte wines and we bring some from Tuscany and we're on the south of the hill and get some you know Aglianico or something so I want everybody to to, to experience this and 
uh, one of their friends who's a, sort of an enophile, he goes, I'm going to bring some cabs. I'm saying, okay, bring them. So he brings some stuff. And I said, well, let's just first do this experiment with the food just to have fun. And so we tasted this uh, Barbaresco, and then we had a Chianti, and then we had this Aglianico. Then he opens the cab. And I was so, like, proud because he goes, oh, now I understand California wines are different. <laughs> I'm like, yes, because mm-hmm. we want. And, I, and it goes right to your point that we want those wines to be different. We want them to taste indigenous. We want them yeah. to represent where they're from yeah. so that we can experience that. That's a very important totally. part of the thing. So the cuisine in these areas, are the, did they evolve then with the, food, the indigenous cuisine? Oh, yeah. I mean, these are, if you look at, um, <clears throat> so if we... If we start in Georgia, um, so the two areas that Black Lamb's focusing on, Slovenian Italian border and Georgia, both of these are uh, in both areas. You have cl- close proximity to Alpic Mountains, so you have the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, and then you have the Alps uh, mm-hmm. north of Slovenia. Um, the uh, the natural conditions are such where it's forced human migration across these areas so the the georgians for um all of you know human history have had to you know fight people coming up from the (laughs) south and trying to take their wine away from them so uh what is present day georgia is actually probably where humans domesticated the grapevine so we think of wine as coming being a western institution but in reality it came from eurasia uh i think that i think that's becoming pretty common knowledge yeah yeah and cre- i mean the more the more archaeological evidence that's yeah. found the and it's also molecular it's uh you know like genetically testing the uh, grape seeds to identify that they're vitis vinifera and then even to identify what variety they are so there are grape varieties that are still grown in georgia that predate christ by you know thousands of years wow. and we have genetic we have we have genetic proof establishing yes, this. Right. So, um, the the a big part of my attraction w- working through Eastern Europe and 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 working my way um, for, as you as you start looking east, if you want to kind of get to the point of origin, you end up in Georgia. Right. And so, in parallel, while we were kind of creating this business, we're creating this business that's focused on these. Uh, you know, very unique, very different, uh, sometimes unusual wines. Uh, we're also trying to kind of understand the history of wine and track it back, and that becomes part of like our identity. Um, Georgia, not only was the grapevine domesticated in Georgia, but this was this was like an Eden for humans, and so all sorts of other plants were also domesticated in this area. So like plums originate in Georgia, uh, hazelnuts, walnuts. Wow. Um, pistachios. Okay. Not pistachios. I don't think pistachios. I think the, I maybe. It's very Middle Eastern thing. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Turkey. I don't. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, Obviously, when you know we have grape seeds that are eight thousand years old that are Vitis vinifera, Georgia didn't exist at this time, nor did Armenia or any of the countries that we recognize today. These were, you know, definitely uh, this was like pre-written language. Um, but because of Georgia, Georgia is very resource-rich in terms agriculturally. Mm-hmm. Um, it is it's like discovering if you if you went to georgia which you know perhaps you you will i was actually invited and i sent peter Koff, the master of wine because i figured he would get way at that time way uh, more out of it than i would have yeah i mean it's you know being that you're you're if you're armenian this you know this area is uh let me let me just bounce off of that for a second because i want to explain vitis vinifera because uh, it's, you know it's the latin classification of the highest level of grapes for wine manufacturing and number two being Vitis Lambrusca and I could have sworn having my trip to Armenia that the wines I tasted were not from Vitis Vinifera grapes because they were so bad. There is a lot of Isabella like there are a lot of like non-Vinifera vines growing I mean Georgia's covered in grapevines like you go into forests there are winemakers who literally trek into forests to harvest fruit from one wild plant that never gets pruned that's just growing talk about biodynamic <laughs> yeah that's i mean that's just yeah it's just i mean it's really you know it's like there are there are some of these abandoned fruit projects where you know the wines aren't always the best if you have to 
carry buckets of grapes. Well, I was accused a by kilometer. a customer of mine that, you know, we have wine grapes in America, which we really don't. But he goes, what about Concord? And I go, yeah, but that's not really a wine grape because it's not Vitis vinifera. But we also know that Armenia was the f- location of the only uh, intact winery that they found 6,000 know, 6, year old and with the sandals and the amphora uh-huh. and all this stuff uh-huh. in there. So it seems to me that the industry... Uh, it's new here. It's even new in Western Europe compared to compared to that. I mean, uh, I think I had Chateau oh, yeah. Carbonneau in here. He's talking about 12th century Chateau, but this is predates that. But let me ask you the question because you said something about the other crops that are coming from Georgia and the and the cradle of those of domestication of plants and nuts and things. I've had apricot wines. I've had pomegranate wines. You know, we've had them all. Concord grape, Kentucky from Kentucky, and. It seems to me that um, the grape itself, and we domesticate it for wine purposes, that's great, but there seems to be no other fruit, and, and I don't know the answer to this question, that, that produces an ethereal beverage as representative of where it's from that creates so much emotion. Mm-hmm. Like if you drink apricot wine, it's apricot wine. Yeah. It doesn't represent the soil and the, the terroir, right? Mm-hmm. It's just an apricot wine. Yeah. And I, I wish I could dig into, and maybe you know, what is it about the grape that has produced a beverage that is so established in our culture and represents where it's from in such great granularity, really? Well, I mean, that yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> well, I'm not, you, I'm not, yeah. sorry, it's just sort of a philosophical yeah. thing that's... I mean, up. I think that... Um, something that is very important to, to me is if we... Uh, I, so I didn't answer a little bit about food, which yeah, just to go yeah, back. Sorry, go ahead. But the uh, so Georgia's also along the spice trade. Georgian cuisine is like it's like encountering Italian food for the first time. You're like it's really? like it's it, 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 so many classic dishes that are so specific that you've never tasted anywhere else. It's like. It, uh, I can't remember <laughs> the chef from Noma, but he the Rene de, it's Rene son Rene. Mm, yeah. Uh, so the the chef at Noma described. Um, uh, the co- like Caucasian cuisine as being one of the last explored, you know, one of the great cuisines of the world that hasn't really been, you know, explored mm-hmm. in, in a in a at a high level. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's due. I That's mean, so interesting. No, the Georgians. If you're vegan, if if you're a carnivore, you could be happy in Georgia. If you're a vegan, you could be happy in Georgia. They, um, I describe the food as something a little bit between Middle Eastern, uh, Indian, and Mexican. Well, Wow, <laughs> and and I, sounds complicated already. Yeah, oh, it's like lots of green herbs. Uh, uh, they bake a lot. They uh, cook with corn, uh, beans. The best, a lot and of this the best. is traditional. This is not uh, nouvelle cuisine, so to speak. That's no, come this around. is tradi- No, this is very traditional. But something that I came to understand in comparing Georgian food to Mexican food is that Mexican food is also influenced by the spice trade, sure. and so the Moors in Spain. A lot of what, like you know, cumin, is not an ingredient. You know, the, 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 there are things that don't grow in Mexico that are part of Mexican cuisine. Yes. Tomatoes come from Mexico. You eat better tomatoes in Georgia than you do in the United States. Yeah. Probably they have older genetics, and they're not the, you know, they're not tomatoes that have been grown for their industrial tomatoes function. Tomatoes here are terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, in Georgia they're like uh, fruit. With Armenia. In Georgia it's like a fruit. Yeah. Like you eat a tomato, it feel like you're eating a piece of fruit. Right. A cucumber feels like a little melon. Um, but wine was born is a product of preservation. You have this plant that produces a huge abundance very rapidly and as quickly as it's as quickly as it's ripe it goes bad right and so uh uh like cheese um like uh, pickles uh wine is a product that's born out of uh, preservation mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. uh and point, yeah. and i i don't like wine that doesn't bear those marks so the wines like the wines that i'm bringing in it's like you feel that they're you know this is yeast yeast and bacteria are uh uh a brewer <laughs> a brewer from pasadena mark craftsman um do you know the craftsman beers sure, yeah right he told me i was at i was drinking in a, in a beer bar you know having conversations with Craft, you know, 1803 i think it is right? yeah yeah <laughs> 1805 and he's like oh you wine people talk about terroir all the time it's it's not about terroir it's about fermentation and uh 
and he he's right in yeah, some to a certain extent yeah yeah to a certain extent he's right and um and i think that uh, with like the natural the categories of natural wine biodynamic wine you know orange wine isn't automatically natural or biodynamic it's just it's a style of winemaking right. the farming and the and the vinification you know will will qualify if it's organic or, sure. or something else but um i have brandon sparks gillis from dragonette here he was a baker my daughter's a baker he's like you know the the, the fermentation science for wine is pales compared to the fermentation science required to understand bread totally because it's just so much so, so much more complicated yeah but it's a great background to understand uh, and so the, there's a lot of movement toward, not movement toward, but there's a lot more wineries experimenting and using natural yeasts and getting away from inoculated yeasts yeah. that influence the character of the direction the wine goes when it's already built into the grape. Yeah. It's already should be part of that process. Yeah. I mean, in, in Georgia, you have the combination of dirt, fire, and grapes. And the most magical wines that I've ever encountered, things that are the most like flavors. It's like how do why don't we have wines that taste like this yeah. anymore? And it's so that they're 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 uh, uh, they make these clay. They're called quevries. They're uh, they're not the same as amphoras because amphoras have handles. Uh, they're intended for transport and storage. Right. Uh, quevries were a technology for winemaking that was specific to you know the processing mm-hmm. of grapes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, how big are they typically? Gallon big or? enough to get inside of and clean yourself. Fifteen, really? fifteen hundred, two thousand yeah. liters. Right. Yeah. Um, 3,000 liters. There's some that, old, there's old ones that they found that are so large they don't know how, that no one alive knows how to make, how to make quevries them. that large any longer. And are those, um, uh, uh, they're fired? They're, they're wood fired. They're wood fired. In a kiln that's they're... built, like a very primitive kiln, so low temperature firing. And is there new versions of this now? Like no, the, make... the, 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 what you want is the old version. Yeah. If you want to have, like, uh, Quevries should not be conflated with uh, tinajas or amphoras. Tinajas are the Spanish, the Spanish version clay, of the same or thing, yeah. the, the, and then you have like Italian amphora um, because they're using much finer clay and firing at much higher temperatures. So the vessels are much more. They're totally inert. It's like yeah. it's like working in concrete. Or yeah, that's why that's what I've seen. Yeah, modern ones that look like they're just. The shape of it is kind of interesting, but they they're going to react with the wine like a concrete. No, the Georgian the neutral. Georgian quevries are uh, they have to line them with beeswax uh, because they're because they're quite porous, yeah. um, and uh, uh, it also serves as like a san- it's a propolis. It's like a, it has an antibacterial uh, yeah, qualities right, right, as yeah. well. Um, but these are much more. The the micro oxygenization that you find in quevery wines is typically much greater than you will in amphora wines because so, the the quevries are buried and there's oxygen in the earth and so they're you know it's 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 a different scenario than a barrel or a stainless steel tank, um, uh, uh, but one where you you're gently you know exposing the wine. To so does it take to go back like you were talking about? We're going back in in history and making wines now that they were made of before all the let's say modern modernization of stainless steel and concrete vats and things. Uh, to do that, um, you're basically eliminating any influence that that a winemaker might have, you know, with direction of its fermentation or um, possibly where. It's being, you know, there's no oak. Do you have oak in your wines? No. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, some of them. Like the Kabai wines are all aged in barrel for the ones I have now are two years in wood. But the Quevery is the, is, uh, uh, it's, it limits what the wine, it limits the choices of the winemaker. But it, it's almost, to make really special wines in Quevery, I think you really have to understand. It's, the Quevery is a tricky vessel to make wine in. It can be, it can, you, can, uh, you can't check in on the wine as easily. Once mm-hmm. you seal them, they, they stay sealed for, you know, typically, it depends on the style of production, but they'll be sealed for some amount of time. So you don't know, you know, you, so before you open it, you give a little prayer <laughs> and hope that it's good. <laughs> But so it's let's, let's, but there's it, but it's not um, but they do have 
they still are able to make critical choices that will arrive at uh, a wine that they intention that they intended Tend to, to produce. Yeah. So let's uh, let's simplify it a little bit. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we had this great conversation. It's already been fifty minutes. And we haven't even discussed orange wine at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so my daughter took me to uh, a Brooklyn wine shop, and she said, "You know, Dad, I want you to taste these wines." I paid seventy-five bucks for a Nier d'Avila from Sicily, supposedly natural. Took it back to the hotel, and it was really literally unpalatable for me. And she agreed that it was just wasn't that good. And that was my first exposure to what something like called natural wines and I've mm-hmm. written an article about natural wines being that is there is no definition really except that it's basically untouched but we but given that which is a very basic definition there's so many things that I can just see the wines here and tasted so many different biodynamic and organic wines and there are a huge array of character there's uh, I tasted a Sardinian um, Sangiovese not too long ago 100% biodynamic music in the vineyards and very very conventional tasting mm-hmm. you know not the rustic style that maybe sometimes these things come with and mm-hmm. then then you can be very rustic mm-hmm. your product line does it represent both of those or is it mostly rustic wines that that amphora i mean this uh clavery quevery quevery uh, version mm-hmm. must be a rustic version of the wine because they, not- they can be very uh like delicate and pr- I, I like i like the range okay. you, you have so. what you'll refer to what i refer to in georgia's old man style which is going to be skins and stems like six months or longer yes and these are like the most tannic wines on earth they're they're far more tannic and they're than, made that way the same way and it's and that's the yeah the, i mean well that's the in, the intention that that is the st- the the characteristic of that style um but then in other parts of this is more typical in the part of georgia that's warmer in the cooler areas you tend to have shorter macerations less extractive wines lower alcohol um you know more delicate uh and um uh, and they can both be made in quevery so the 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 quevery the quevery is just it's an important vessel it has a long history it's romantic it's Hmm. very difficult to make wine in the wines that can that are made in quevery can be quite uh unique and and sometimes special but ultimately it's just a container it's really the the first uh, you know the first element of of any Georgian wine is going to be, you know, what is the grape? Where is it planted? When are you harvesting usual, it? Right. Yeah, okay. it's that's that's really. So it's not the quevery that makes the wine. Right. It's the and this is an. I, this is for me important to point out just because there are there there are people in that are working with Georgian wine who have this uh, perspective that if it's not made in quevery, it's not real. And I think that that's abs- it's the same no. as saying every wine should be oaky yeah right. we would yeah. never want every so, wine to right. be oaky yeah, you're right and so it's uh it's interesting that, well i guess it's i guess it depends how how much you want to peel back and be uh you know like a caveman stomping on grapes and making your own wine and that's and that should be the authentic way to make wine because that's why humans started making wine and that that's not right either right no I we want yeah. it wants to be a palatable drinkable something we can enjoy and become part of our lifestyle so what with Black Lamb now, what is it you are trying to do with the public? And where is the marketplace? What are people responding to? Is it restaurants? Is it retail? Are people responding to these wines? Pretty, yeah, I, I would say both restaurant and retail pretty evenly. Um, we were just like looking, we are doing some analysis of which wines are selling well and kind of trying to, you know, because it's, the, the, uh, if you sell French wine, you know what people buy and yes. you know what sells and, right. and and you can you can you know you have some rough idea of the numbers right. with this stuff it's like you know you buy a hundred cases of this wine and five cases of this weird wine and the five cases disappear like nothing and then the hundred cases sits there, there yeah. and so it's just it's you know it's hey, welcome uh, to the wholesale wine business yes yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah what a fun you know you 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 uh you you either have too much or not yes, enough. Right. You never you, you never have just the right, right. amount. It's, it's of course you either have too much wine or not enough wine. Um, but uh, uh, so this case, the two styles that we see really like our customers liking are the skin fermented white wines, uh, high extract white wines, and low extract red wines. So let me ask you this: the orange wine thing. No oranges. You know, uh, what's his name? Bob uh, Trinquero, you know, his 
whatever the story is, the fermentation guy was arrested when he's making his dry uh, rosé, and he ended up with white Zinfandel, and it's this you know hot market thing, and you know, makes him famous, and Sutter Home goes off the charts, and hmm. now he has this fancy wine in Napa because it's paid for by you know two forty nine white Zinfandel. So, but that was that was basically uh, taking a red grape and uh, fermenting it like a white wine, and you end up with pink. Mm-hmm. When when did orange wine, which is white grapes, you know, macerated like a uh, red wine, when did this happen? And has it always been around? And we just it just wasn't part of our regular cuisine or part mm-hmm. of our regular routine, mm-hmm. or is it something that's just starting that people are? My daughter loves it. I, what's the story behind? Both. It? I think both. Like the what we're what we're experiencing today is a renaissance for these styles, but this style of wine production predates white wine production. White grapes. White grapes were macerated. Prob- most probably, vineyards were mixed with white and red grapes, and everything was going and everything was going in together. Um, uh, but the, in Georgia, they actually they hold the white grapes in higher regard than the reds uh, in 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 some certain i mean uh, in some certain ways Mm -hmm. because with red wine you can't leave it on the skins if you leave it on the skins for the length of it's like a it's a bit of a paradox you can leave the white grape with the skins for longer and it becomes deeper in color and more expressive and richer you leave the red wines on the skins for that for longer you actually start pulling color out of the wine and the wines become you know they 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 lose something and so the red wines are typically when you're making when georgians are making wine in quevries the red grapes are in quevery with the skins for two to six weeks the white grapes are with the skins for you know up to a year Uh, really yeah and so they actually so the the white wines will be more tannic than the red wines because the acid content in the skin the white wine is probably just as volatile or just as strong as as the red there's acids. no there's nothing there's nothing f- uh, physiologically different between red and white grapes other than pigment other than color, yeah. the uh, cl- uh what's his uh, clark um uh he wrote uh postmodern winemaking oh, uh no uh clark smith he's uh he he's like a he's made you know he's like super scientist for making big heavy duty red wines and uh it's all about like Tannins, you know, suspending, you know, polymerizing the the uh, <laughs> your tannins so that they like stay in solution, and you and you can have like rich, you know, he he, he does science. A lot of his work has been, you know, the the kind of science that would support making like really great, you know, trying to take something like Screaming Eagle and making it better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's what's the marketplace? But, he's, then for but he so he, he 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 what he claims is that German technology, uh, stainless steel refrigerant, and um, sterile filtration that that is really that that really changed that that in the cellar that marks a change and that's what gave us white wine and rosé. White wine and rosé are the same thing. Red wine and uh, red wine and orange wine are the same thing. Yeah, right. That makes sense. So. He's saying the Germans have created this idea of filtering and Mosul and producing during standard. the industrial, like pre-industrial revolution. Yeah. Mosul, the sto- like semi-sweet German wines right. were like that was the rage in Europe, and the Germans figured out technology where you didn't have to be in Germany; you could make Mosul-style wines all over the planet uh, because you can you know because you, you can control it you now control. we have now yeah. we have the, the the mechanics to control it and 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 then what has basically happened is that the wines just got dry so the sugar it's still that it's still that same you know that same reductive fresh primary style and uh, but we the, the sugar is just no longer yeah, sure, right, present right. and and like a lot of people prefer to drink like there's a lot of people who just drink red wine. If you just drink red wine, your other wine is orange wine. Yes, because it's, it's the same thing. Same thing. I mean, at yeah. least tactically and phenotically. Yeah, like phenolic ripeness is the same, and everything's the same. You get. I mean, you don't peel a plum right. or a peach before you eat it. Right. Yeah. I, I consider <laughs> part of my mission is to reduce the volume. Like every now and then, I like a glass of rosé. Yeah. And every now and then, I like a glass of white wine, but part of the mission of black lamb is to see the proportion of uh uh white grapes processed as 
uh, white wine versus orange wine to you know I, I think there should be more this is this is yeah it should be there should be more of this a lot of orange wines you know orange wine is a style of production that hasn't had a lot of modern practice yes so naturally there aren't gonna you know people are learning it's not it's not gonna well, be as the, that's kind of the question because I've had such a dynamic range of these wines so let's say uh, well I'm gonna have a Napa Chard so pretty convinced it's going to be if it's well made it's going to be pretty oaky it's going to have some fruit flavors and they'll be heavy on my tongue it'll be malolactic fermentation mm-hmm. we, that's what we expect right mm-hmm. but is there is there a terroir generated or style specific generated amongst forget georgia in the mid in that part of the world but even in america where i'm going to get an orange version of sauvignon blanc and have some profile that i expect to get because I did that, or is it too early in the career of this fermentation style to, yeah. to have that? Uh, and it's just still an experiment every time I buy a new bottle. The uh, yeah, it's it, it. You need to you need to you have to have uh, uh, somebody to buy from that you right, trust right. who can you know who can interpret your taste and guide you to it. Um, the the or obviously oranges are not you the the term orange wine is a reference to the color of course of, that the wine becomes <laughs> right. but good I'm glad you brought that up because <laughs> but it's but it all but there's there, there's a within the industry we disagree do we call it macerated white wine do we call it orange wine do we call it amber wine and uh, I have I like you cannot make uh, a lot of orange wine is the color that it is not because of skin contact but because of oxidation Mm -hmm. you can't make an orange wine darker than the grape that you harvest so if you're harvesting a grape like Sauvignon Blanc or you know Tokai Friulano something that in harvest looks green it's not going to give you an orange wine even if you macerate it unless you oxidize it Mm -hmm. and so if, if like we have Sauvignon Blanc and Friulano that's two weeks on the skins you leave Pinot Grigio on the skins for two weeks, it looks like it's onion color. Right, sure. Sauvignon Blanc or Friolano, they don't really change, change color. Huh. And so um, uh, the diversity that you'll see in red wine, anywhere from something so light that you'd call it a rosé, all the way to the like heaviest... Uh, you know, most tannic, uh, uh, like uh, you mean Sagrantino. Like one, of, one of the Pinot Noir that I got from Chalk Hill that was really kind of dark enough to call it red wine. And that's what I did, and I got in trouble because I said it's rose, and I got decided. <laughs> but it customers felt- were confused. I call it red wine. It said rose in the bottle, but it was really dark. It was really dark. I it's love like, that. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. So, do do we have to then, if we're going to make it um, an orange wine, so to speak, if we're going to macerate the skins uh, with the juice? Do we have to filter it? No. I mean, not filter it. Do we have to leave it this way as, as just as a social stigma to this type of wine? Does it have to be cloudy? No. So we can do that. And what happens if we filter or find something like that? Does it change it's, the character? It's the same as with red. It's the same with red wine. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't see, we don't see the hazy red wines. Yeah, we don't. Because there's Cause they're pigment. Yes. Yeah. So if you hold it up to the light. You like, usually can see it. Yeah. yeah you, can, you can see if a red wine is opaque or shiny. With orange wine, it's more, the, the wine is more transparent. Yes. So you can you see, see you can actually see that there's this material. You know, it's, uh, uh, we're not dogmatic about whether or not a wine is filtered or not filtered the wine should be good yeah and if the situation demands that the producer filter it and that's what they choose that's to do idea. then uh how many supplier how but many nobody no, nobody that we're working with sterile filters these are you know this is just to remove like yeah, right. gross particulate how many different wineries now are you working with about mm, 15 like 15 to 20 oh that's this pretty good book already. Yeah, yeah. In all Georgian or Slovenia, Georg- Georgian, Slovakia. Uh, no Slovakia, but that will hopefully be coming. Um, right now, just Slovenia, one Hungarian producer, uh, and Georgia. And then Croatia. Uh, yeah, I, I am actually. I'm working a little bit with some. My my taste gravitates uh, 
I, I like parts. I like some Croatian wines. I thought, I thought they yeah. were fascinating. Yeah, definitely fascinating. Um, the uh, a lot of the wines in Croatia are these like big. You know, they're kind of they're they're a little bit more along the lines of like classical red yes, wine. They are yes, and and we're kind of looking. They're for very the, European. They're very Western European like yeah. in some character. And we're and I think we're <clears throat> trying to. We want to work in the fringes. Yeah. We're a small company, and there's room in the market to do that. And Are you so, still working with your wife then? Yeah. Oh wow, that's yeah, pretty she, good. Yeah, she she does all the real 25 work. Twenty-five years. She's downstairs right now. My wife. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not your wife. My wife. <laughs> My wife and I've been together twenty years. Oh, there you go. So oh, that's great. No, we've, we we. we we figured it out, except that um, you know my daughter, the way I have the one daughter's home still, and she just hates it when she, we go to dinner because we start discussing work, you know, because yeah. we've, we we have problems to solve or whatever. And so she's like, "Oh my gosh, only you're talking about work." Yeah, but I have I have created uh, quite a um, wine critic out of my wife. So uh-huh. when we got married, it was like Gallo Chablis, and now you know I bring stuff home, and she's I can see by her face, you know. Well, oh, this is well, this is something I should feature on the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, I have that exact same. The wines land, Kristen. We bring them. You know, we 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 start opening them up and tasting them. And uh, you know, typically she'll like a couple of them, and 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 the rest of them, she's like, no, I'm going to drink those yeah. ones. And but I'm like, you well, find well, we have saying, to sell all these. <laughs> yeah, but you find yourself saying, wait, you don't, you're not experiencing the wine I need you to experience I want you to f- understand like the source of this and the terroir including what you're talking about the cultural be- the cultural history behind the wine because I obviously taste much more than she does and I appreciate I think I I'm gonna say I appreciate more than she does but I get the esoteric value of them be- even though they may not be something she tastes likes the taste of yeah right and I think that's part of the th- what we have to teach and I'm, I would guess in your industry your side of the business uh, particularly with these kinds of wines we want to have the consumer reflect on that and and maybe broaden their horizons a little bit by by thinking gee if i can really detect this character and i can feel like i'm in georgia i can feel like i'm in this region of georgia or wherever i'm at that we get them to understand more value behind wine like for instance Mm -hmm. when i go home from work Today I tasted probably sixty wines already. She's gonna ask for a glass of wine. I try to contend with her your mood, what we're gonna have for dinner, uh, you know, whether the kids were pulling on her shirt tail at the time when they were younger, and I try to bring something to the, in a glass that she's gonna feel more like the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm-hmm. And I wonder with these kinds of wines with the consumer, are we getting positive feedback? Are we getting? customers saying wow I, I understand this part I'm seeing what you're talking about is that what's happening uh, yeah I think for um, yeah or, orange wine consumers are interested in orange wine this is you know the, the the category started popping up in the United States maybe 10 years ago and uh, the first people that were drinking it were like the you know Psalms and you know they kind of talked about it and then it was on to the next thing and um you can find plenty of articles talking about the fad. I mean, just recently there was an article in the New Yorker uh, that like created an upset because the guy completely dismisses orange wine as a category, which which I think is. I mean, he doesn't it's know ridiculous. Yeah, yeah he, it's it's you know it's uh, it, he he's not a wine. He comes from a fashion background, and so the article was well researched. It was well written, and I'm glad because I think it gets. If I read it and I knew nothing about orange wine, I'd be really curious. Like. I've got to taste this yeah, stuff right, that yeah. this guy's saying. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. But um but no, it's just um the the as a category, I think it's uh wines used to be different and this is, you know, this is the category right now that really um almost any time you encounter it, it can offer you something that, you know, that is an experience. Yes. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it. Maybe you don't like it when you start drinking it, but by the time you get to the bottom of the bottle, you do like it. Yeah. Or maybe you don't like it and then you start eating and then you, you like, like it. it. Right. And I think with um As like with a lot of wines, right? Georgia in Georgia you don't uh wines I mean for me too, wine's not a cocktail. It's it's uh it's uh, seasoning and it's uh it's part of cuisine. Like and and I think everything that you like you know how are we feeling who are we with what does the moment 
you know demand uh, that will uh, you know there there are orange wines that I'll pull out that are perfectly appropriate to drink like a cocktail you don't need yeah. to eat anything they're you know gentle and then there's things that you couldn't drink if you don't have you know some fatty piece of meat in your mouth yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's already been an hour and 10 minutes which is fascinating we got to taste some wines we can probably do this again and again and i would love to have you back we'll pick a new subject of uh, what's going on out in that part of the world and we'll kind of peel that back too but it's been yeah. fascinating to have you here great to see you again thank you after well, all these years and likewise. you tell uh, miha that uh, his video is still up i will <laughs> <He's>, uh, <laughs> I definitely will yeah, let we him can, know. We can check how many plays it's got. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> back then, who knew? We'll try to pump it up a little yeah. bit. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should, you know, what I've been doing with some of those old videos back in the day, I just, I'm peeling off the audio. But the cameras were so restricted on how much they could record, and the audio was so much less quality than it is today that, that I was using my equipment. But I've been taking some of those audios and peeling them out of the videos, pairing them up for about a half hour to 45 minutes worth of, so wait till he gets a hold of that. He's really going to be upset with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't anyway, tell him. Cheers, yeah. Seth. Cheers, Seth. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.